they're still our brother. They're still our sister. They have a broken spirit. And whatever I can do to help them and show them that we love them and we care for them, just give them a hug, a handshake. And some people might think that, you know, that's really nothing, but it is. It makes a big difference. Okay. We're here with Russell, Russell Forrest. It's so, Anishinaabe Ojibwe Mohawk elder. And he's a homeless man here in Minneapolis. And he comes to the Indian Center where Mike serves every Sunday. You want to tell us how you feel about what Mike does for the community here? Well, I think it's good because see, Mike doesn't just do it because you're homeless. He does it because the young people that come here are uh, addicted to that poison, that alcohol. And so Mike knows that they don't eat. So he figures if he feeds them, at least they get to eat and fight off some of that alcohol. But he's been in this community and he's been doing so much for them. He cares about the people out of his own heart. That's what makes him a good man. Everybody knows him and they love him and they care about him. They support him in the best way they can. And I think it's a great thing that he does. He could, he could be a really good leader amongst these people. You know? And everybody, like I said, everybody respects him and they come to him and they know Mike will help them. And he does it, he does it because he, he does it not because he has to, he does it because his heart tells him to. That's a good thing. Hello, I'm Kimberly Acosta with Indian Country TV, and I'm here with Mike Forsha in the Minneapolis American Indian Center. And every Sunday, he, out of his own pocket, and a lot of volunteers, they get together and feed the community and the homeless. Can you tell us about that and how when you started doing that? Yeah, we started probably about a little more than four years ago. I used to have a place across the street, and we would uh, we would cook for them and then take it to the different homeless camps. Well, then when I opened up here in this location, it was perfect to have them come to us. And so we cook here every Sunday, uh, rain or shine, doesn't matter what day it is. If it's a Sunday, we'll be here cooking. What made you decide to start coming here and doing this for the community? Well, it's just that sometimes uh, it seems like our homeless people are invisible. And we have people who have blinders on. And some of those people, you know, were you know, drinkers themselves. And um, so they climbed up and out, which is good, but um, it seems like they just didn't see the homeless. And, um, and to me, they're our brothers and sisters no matter what. And sure, they might be drunk and they might be not as clean as some of us, but uh, we still have to take care of them. And some of them aren't out there drinking, they're just kind of on the streets, you know. And um, can you tell us about that? Well, you know, we have so many homeless here, uh, homeless natives, and there are other places where they can go and eat, but um, being segregated for so long, they kind of like keep to themselves, and so they would just uh, opt not to use those services. And so uh, we have probably 99% natives coming here. Every now and then we'll get someone else, but it's almost always native. And a lot of them don't use the shelters. They stay under the bridges and on the streets. Why is it? Uh, for the same reason. Uh, they don't want to go there and be amongst uh, uh, a lot of the riffraff that's going on and uh, a lot of the drug dealing going on in some of these shelters. And um, uh, I think they would just rather be in God's creation, you know, under the bridge or sit sleeping next to the Indian Center here. Um, they just opt not to use those places, those services. And they're like, a, I know that they're like the invisible people because people are, you know, they go and they work and they live their life and it's like they don't even see them. Um, but you guys are making a difference in, and you're doing it out of your own pockets. Is there any way people can help to help you guys with what you're doing? Well, you know, I've been told several times that I should have a 501c and three be a nonprofit. But when you do that, then they take over. Then they want people to sign in their name and probably social security number and, you know, got check this off and check that off. And I didn't want to go that route. And so if anybody wants to volunteer, you know, their time is the most that we can ask for. And if they can't give us any of their time, you know, we always accept food. And if they don't want to do that, well, then we'll accept cash. But, um, but yeah, I didn't want to be a 501c3 or a nonprofit. And so it works out best this way for us. 
A lot of people don't understand. They think, you know, why don't they just get up and go get a place or get a job? But they don't understand what, you know, how difficult it is. Can you explain that to people? Well, you know, I think that our people still suffer historical trauma. And I always say that this is not the kind of uh, society that the Creator made for us. He made the perfect uh, environment for us. And then Western society comes over and they say, well, we can do better than God. And so this is what we're left with. And this is not how the Creator meant us to live. And so I think that is part of the reason why we have so much what they call mental illness or bipolar is because this this world that has been created for us isn't a natural world. And so I think that's part of the reason they have it so hard because they have to get a driver's license and an ID and go punch the time clock. And that's fine for some people, but there's a lot of people who just can't handle that. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us with what you guys are doing or how other people can help? Um, well, like I said before, it's just a matter of coming in and seeing what we're doing. And we're not, we don't publicize it and we don't advertise it. It's all word of mouth. And um, so uh, we've had uh, uh, one, one person or a community uh, organization, uh, the, the detox over here, um, they wrote us out a check for I think it was $350 one day and they like what we're doing, and they serve food too. But some of these places that serve are dwindling because we're getting so busy. We started out with 19, and sometimes we have well over 100 people show up. And like I said, I know they're not all homeless. Uh, some people come in with their families, their little ones, but if they're hungry, we're gonna feed them. That's, you know, and we treat them with respect, uh, with dignity. Uh, we laugh, we joke, we have a good time. And sometimes during the week, we'll get a couple of people that are down and out. They need food. And so I have a restaurant here that I, it's called the Wolves Den. And so sometimes during the week, we get, you know, half a dozen people that need something to eat. And somebody will send them over and we'll feed them for free. And we tell them that, you know, we don't do this for free. But on Sunday, you're welcome to come. Anytime on Sunday, you're welcome to come. We don't care who you are. And we'll make sure you have some good food to eat. How did you decide to do this out of your, you know, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't, they just turn their backs, but you take the time every Sunday, no matter rain, shine, holiday. That's right. It doesn't matter what day it is. We're here on Easter. If it's Christmas, doesn't matter what day it is, we're here. Um, uh, my friend Wade Kieser and I actually started this um, uh, when we first started, and um, I guess it is that, to me, my community is like my medicine. It's I need that. And um, and so I try to help as many people as I can. Um, and if I can't, I try to turn them to somebody who can help them. Hello, I'm here with Wade Kieser, and he's uh, one of the helpers here with Mike, helping feed the homeless in the community on Sunday breakfasts, I believe, right? Yes. And can you share with us your story on... Where you, you told me at one point that you were homeless, and but and you, then you come down here now that you're doing better and help continue to help with the homeless in the community. Um, well, I've been homeless off and on through from my teen years. Um, you know, I was just just choices I made. You know, to not do it this way, and you know the the way that it's healthy. You know, it's a choice. You know. Um, and working. I always tried to stay working. I was even homeless while I was working, you know, couching up or crashing on couches and things like that. And other times I'd be so drunk, you know, just like cause my own misery and problems and um, eventually kind of slowed that down and quit drinking on the streets while I was homeless because it just didn't feel safe, didn't feel right, got too depressing to do that, you know. And so I'm, you know, I'm 42 now. I would say I actually just came off the homeless stuff fairly recent, you know? It's only been a couple of years that I've actually maintained some regular housing over my head. Um, but I always realize that I'm just a step away from being back in that, um, in that life again. But I don't ever forget. And I don't like to forget the people that are still out there. 
have that are going to be out there um, and try to do what I can to uh, help them along, make things better, if not perfect for them, you know, and let them know that somebody does care, you know, you live that life, you don't, you take it with you forever, so. You're on a, do it, working with a lot of different organizations trying to be a voice for the homeless. Can you share with us what you're doing? Um, well, I I guess I, I just get up and I try to put uh, um, a face and a, a solid stories, you know, uh, the real stories of what life is like on the streets, of not having a roof over your head, uh, not having regular meals and being able to shower. Um, I have spoke at uh, Minnesota State Capitol a few times, uh, other places. Sometimes I get called in uh, when we get visiting groups in town that want to talk about that, you know, and I get called in to talk about it, you know, because I, I don't try to make a pretty face and, you know, on it. I don't try to gloss it over, you know. I mean, I'll tell the real stories of what I know to be true which goes on every day with this. Can you share some of that with us? Um, yeah, it's, you know, I guess, you know, I, I look at the whole homelessness thing and I feel for everybody that's in that boat, but I tend to concentrate on our native people because that's where my heart is, that's who I am. And my grandfather died on the streets, you know, and the detox was built because of the way he died back in the early 70s. Um, and there's many other people have gone down the same road and still going on today. Um, when I see the women out here on the streets and I say they look like raccoons and I'm not trying to be funny, it's because they got beat up, they got black eyes. Um, recently a young woman was raped by her own uncle and another man, and I don't know how many more guys got at her just about a week ago. And so we're trying to push that and find out what happened and get the police involved and, and, you know, trying to do something about it and saying this is not going to be tolerated, you know. Um, and, you know, the kids that are out there going homeless, teenagers and whole families moving around. We see them coming in for Sunday breakfast. Uh, I, I just, I feel for those people, you know, these kids aren't able to go to school on a regular basis no regular meals, you know, they don't get birthdays, they don't get Christmas, um, and it's heartbreaking, you know, and I kind of see it's like, it's a broken spirit, and the longer it goes on, the harder it is to come back, to do something with your life, you know, to be able to be productive, um, yeah, it just, it goes on too long, and there's a lot of people that just kind of turn away from it shy away from it um, because of their own experiences with themselves or family members, friends, whatever, and I understand that, but it's not going to go away if you ignore it, you know, everybody can do something to help out there, and, uh, you know, I, I get tired of seeing a face one day and then they're gone the next, they're, they're dead, you know. They froze to death, or they drank themselves to death, or they were murdered, and you know those type of things that are going on. You know, it it goes on way too much, and it shouldn't have to be this way. Um, and I guess you know when when I look at it, I, I do get upset with our native leadership, be it in the urban area or the reservations. You know, where are you guys? You guys are out there talking a lot of stuff out there. But what are you doing to address this? This is a huge problem amongst our people, you know? Um, and that something I called, you know, homeless in our own homeland. It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. Where is the response from the, the leadership out there? Um, why aren't we getting more active in trying to find ways to solve this problem and advocate on their behalf for those people who can't speak for themselves, you know, or don't know how to go about doing it for themselves. You know, it's, I just, you know, I, I get upset with that, you know, I really do. It, it means something to me, and I know from my own experience of being turned away that 
you know, I I could still be out here, you know, but I I kind of got pulled in. Well, I got pulled in actually at uh, I had to have this thing called heading home Hennepin. 10 year plan to end homelessness, which I thought was kind of dumb because you're not going to end homelessness in 10 years, you know. Um, ambitious plan, yes. The county, city, state, and the local churches are involved and other nonprofits. Um, but I got pulled into their first big meeting, and I was homeless at the time, and I was hanging out with a couple guys from the Cola drop in center. And um, I went and checked out this meeting, and then this a uh, woman came up to me, a white woman came up to me and said, would you want to get up and speak about your situation and what it's like for you out there? And I said, oh, okay. You know, so I got up there and there's all these people out there. there are, there's cops and lawyers and social service people, you know, professional people, and, you know, private sector, public sector. I mean, there was like 300 and something people there that I've never seen before. And I got up and I spoke, you know, and I talked about my grandpa and my grandma and how I grew up, you know, in South Minneapolis and my circumstances and that type of thing. And, and when I got up there and spoke, I spoke for probably about 10 minutes. And they were like clapping when I got done. I was like, whoa, you know, I wasn't trying to go for all that. I was just being really honest and putting stuff out there. How my feet were tired and they get blistered up. and you know, from wet socks and wet shoes and no place to shower up and, you know, trying to stay warm and dry and that type of thing. And all of a sudden it just kind of clicked in me that, you know, I could do more than just talking about it. You know, we've got to wake some people up. We've got to get them going. We've got to get them to be active participants in addressing this. And so that's where it kind of took off. And that was back in 2006. Um, it was... I've been kind of rolling with it ever since, you know, even when I'm staying in the shelter, you know, the, the shelter people would call me the peacemaker. Um, not too many of our native people stay in the church shelters, you know. Why is that? Well, a long history of bitterness towards the church, you know, don't want to take handouts from the church and government, you know, or um, the racism that goes on at that level, you know, you're at the lowest level of life, so to speak, that things get real ugly. You don't have much to fall back on, so to be hateful towards somebody because they're black or they're native or, you know, Mexican or white or whatever, you know, that's what was going on. And our people do get picked on a lot in those shelter situations. And it's non-natives who oversee these programs and shelters. They don't understand that. They're not feeling it. They're not looking at it through our eyes and feeling it the way we do. So they get frustrated and don't want to be there. Um, and you said a lot of the churches are the ones that get the funding for the homeless. Whether that's why it's so hard to get help for our native brothers and sisters, correct? Yeah, and it, it seems like it's not so much spoken anymore, but the assimilation policies are still on. You know, um, you do it our way still, and we we know that assimilation has failed. You know. Um, We've never been able to be ourselves and do it our way. And they're still trying to do that. You know, they want you to sober up. They want you to do this and that, you know, or they want you to attend church or something like that. Or, you know, not everybody, not all these organizations and churches do that. There are some that do, but it's just resentment towards how our people are treated and how we've got to this place that we're in now, you know, that... A lot of people, a lot of our people carry that every day with them, you know, that resentment, that anger and frustration, you know, the helplessness that goes along with it. It's, it's hard. And when they call me the peacemaker in the shelter, I was like, what? You know, and they said, well, you get up and you're not afraid to talk to these guys and the fight's going to break out. And, you know, somebody's screaming, you know, he's like a dirty drunk Indian, he's down bigger, this and that. And it's like you jumped right up in between and just... You know, got them to calm down, mellow up, you know. And you have many different volunteers that help you. You want to share with us who they all are? Oh, sure. Um, we got uh, people from the community come in to help. Uh, we have a doctor that comes in to help almost every Sunday. And um, 
they just they just hear word of mouth what we're doing and they'll come in for maybe three months six months every Sunday then we won't see them for a while then they'll show back up again so I never have had once a lack of help never once I know that when I come here and I open the doors that there's going to be at least four or five maybe six people wanting to come and help is there any stories you want to share with us about some of the people that you feed well that's just the thing you know they have families they have children um, and we've had probably a half a dozen deaths since I started. Uh, people found, you know, laying around a bush or in the back alley somewhere. Um, and it's always hard because I know these people. And um, I, I try not to preach to them about not drinking and stuff, but they know. And um, so I guess that's just the thing that the people with the blinders on and they drive up and down Franklin and a lot of people think that this is the Indian problem and and which it is everything they say is true they're drunk they're dirty they're whatever they say I agree but when you look at the other side of it they're still our brother they're still our sister they have a broken spirit and whatever I can do to help them and show them that we love them and we care for them just give them a hug a handshake and some people might think that, you know, that's really nothing, but it is. It makes a big difference in their lives. I know that it does because when six years ago when I was in New York City, walking down the street, you know, and no one was just filled with people, the one person that came up to me was a homeless Apache man, and all he wanted to do was talk. And I sat, stood there in the rain for 20 minutes and listened to his story, a Vietnam veteran with one hand and he had a hook on the other one, you know, and I just sat and listened to him. When he got done, he's just like, and do you remember my name? And I'm like, it's Joe Lucas. And I'll never forget Joe Lucas, because I stood there and heard about his story, and he came to New York City to better his life, and yet he was living on a bench in Central Park. And that's what I see around here, you know. I was talking with um, Russell earlier and his story on how long he's been here, but what he's all been through in his life. And you must hear a lot of those stories from a lot of the different people around. Yeah, we hear a lot of stories. Russell's one of them, and um, Russell's been shunned. Uh, a lot of places and um, a lot of it is, is his own doing but um, even though he is uh, uh, trespassed from different places and stuff like I said we'll make sure that we bring out a plate of food for him and anybody else we don't ask if they have warrants out or if they're wanted by the law or anything like that it doesn't matter if they're hungry we'll feed them well, I've been wandering the streets about seven years in a wheelchair since I had my stroke in 2000 I survived. That's what the old guys, the old guys call me a survivor. I always seem to make it to the next day. That's what I do. If I wake up in the morning and I can see the, the morning and the people, then I know I'm still alive and that's what makes me feel good. Because I don't want for much and I'm not greedy or nothing. I just, I just want to be here and exist. And I have four good reasons too. And that's my four sons. As long as I'm here, then uh, I know my sons are okay. okay. And you've been living a clean, sober life for 30 years, giving back to the people yourself. Yeah, for over 30 years. You're that's, a, and that's what people know about me. If I have it, they can have it. You know. And nobody bothers me because you know they don't. They know I don't have much. But they know that if they need it, they can come to me and ask. And if I have it, I'll give it to them. You know. And that's the way I was raised by my grandmother. My grandma was a big Christian Mohawk woman. Uh, they, they don't have the Indian, and my people. We don't have female chiefs, but they call them clan mothers. And my grandmother was a clan mother and a holy woman. When I was six, she used to take me to the woods and she'd pick plants and have me eat them. And it would make me well again. She knew every plant in the woods that was good for you and what they were what they were good for. That's what made her so special with our people. Is there anything you want to say hey. to give a message out there for people? Hey. No, I just want them to leave the alcohol alone and the room to use that tobacco. The tobacco is our first. Hey, brother. Hey, sister, how are you? My sister Jane, <laughs> her, her husband. And you're saying to use the tobacco? To take the tobacco and use it and remember to pray and give thanks. You see, in my people's way, we don't ask for things. We, we consider that a Washitu way of doing things. The machine you always reach and grabbing and taking. 
But we don't do that. We don't ask for anything when we talk to the spirits. We give thanks for what we have. Because we are taught that the earth is our mother and that she'll take care of us as long as we respect them and remember to use that sacred tobacco. And that was the first medicine that came to our people was that tobacco. Even though there's uh, all kinds of medicines, the tobacco was our original. Give us some examples of some stories of some of your friends here that are homeless that you help out with every week. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, everybody's kind of got their individual stories. Um, there's a friend of mine where, you know, I've been kind of, well, I'm a friend of Mike's also. Um, when he was coming up, he just got out of prison. He was on the streets and drinking. And I started talking, you know, when he sobered up and stuff. And we we're talking about our situations. And he wanted to get involved. And so we started hanging out more and more and kind of looking at what what's out there available to us. Um, and he was, you know, he's a drummer and singer and, you know, and, uh, artist and and uh, we started talking about more and more and talking with Mike Forsha and my friend came up with the name of Oyate Ashkabeus which I thought was pretty good flow to the name you know and it's it stands out you know people's helper people's messenger you know and we're combining the two languages you know to address this the Lakota and the Ojibwe yeah, yeah you know um, and that, because that's who we're mainly that's our main population here, is mm -hmm. Lakota, Dakota, and Ojibwe's here. But we've got all other tribal nations here, too, you know. This is Twin Cities. And always been in, uh, a drawing of, you know, drawing in Indian people here from all over the place. But, you know, we figured, well, that's a good name. And we just did it. We, we started this thing up just to help our people, you know. We get a little bit of donations. So we would take that money and go out and buy some food. We would go out you get like jugs of water, you know, um, try to help out with backpacks or, you know, hygiene items, that type of thing. And we'd even buy tobacco, pouches of tobacco, um, because people, you know, so I took some heat from county people and other people involved with homelessness, shouldn't be giving them cigarettes and tobacco. Well, to our people, sometimes they offer it in a traditional manner and it comforts them, makes them feel better that, you know, they're doing that. They also want a cigarette. And sometimes dealing with people on the street, life is rough enough. I'm not there to judge you, man. But if I can get you a cigarette and you need that cigarette, I'm going to give it to you. You know, I'm not I'm not going to withhold that. You know, I'm not there to be the judge. You know, Kevin was, uh, he was right along with that, you know. Um, he's been on the streets. I'm not sure where he's at now. His wife recently passed. Um and he was living with her for a while, so he's back on the streets. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, I worry about him, where he's at, you know. Um, like the elders that are on the streets, you know, we had uh, an elder a few years back, a uh, really nice guy, you'd see him all over town. Well, he was homeless on the streets, he lost his apartment because he couldn't pay for it anymore, you know, he was going out to the casino, catching the bus to the casino, and he gambled his money away, he wasn't paying his rent, so he got kicked out, but he was too proud to say anything to his family. And then when we found out that he was homeless, you know, like, whoa, you know, Mike and Kevin and myself and some other people, you know, we just make a point, come by to Wolf's Den, get something to eat, we'll set you up, we'll try to find a way to get you into some housing, um, you know, and make sure he's not getting dehydrated, especially in the winter or summertime, and, um, but, you know, we did what we could, but he died on the street, you know, and it was kind of hush-hush. And nobody, just a few of us were saying, what's going on here? You know, why isn't there more of a reaction from our community about this? And, you know, where's, where, where is everybody? Why did this old man have to go down that road? You know, why did his family shut him out? You know, why did this community shut him out? They knew there was a problem, that he had that problem, and he was a veteran. He didn't deserve to be on the streets like that, you know, but he was just thrown away, which seems to happen quite a bit, you know. A lot of a lot of our people are thrown away by our own people. We're our own worst enemy, you know. Our leadership, in a lot of ways, I think has failed us. Um, spend a lot of time talking and addressing issues out there, but not actually dealing with the issues and the people that it's... That are living with these issues, you know. 
it's it's just really sad, you know. Um, it's like the young moms out there, you know, they on occasion they found young moms and children around here, you know, froze to death in the winter time. And, you know, sometimes they, they don't even know who they are. Where do they go when they don't go to the shelters in the at night? Um, you know, it could be anywhere. If they got a vehicle, they stay in a vehicle. It could be at friends or an abandoned house. Um, go hang out in a white castle or something for as long as they can to get out of the cold. Uh, you you have to be really creative when you're homeless. You know, you really do. It pulls a lot out of you to get something where you're dry and somewhat warm or whatever. You have to be really creative, you know. I've known people who've called up into like building vents and stuff like that. You know, made spaces for themselves. And, you know, people crawling into dumpsters and stuff. You know, that type of thing. Um, it's it, what our people don't go to these shelters, you know, the history of the churches and the government, you know, like I said, they, they'd rather sleep outside. They're sleeping down by the river. Um, can't really sleep under the bridges anymore because the city went and put up those uh, steel rods up under the bridges in those little areas that they'd sleep in so that, you know, make it unfriendly. They did this purposely so they wouldn't sleep there. Um, What's the city doing to even help with the homeless anything? Um, yeah, they, they're, they're doing their thing. Like I said, that 10-year plan and homelessness, which started uh, 2006, um, they're doing their thing. Um, and I worked with it for a point. I was part of their executive committee. I worked with a group called Homeless Against Homelessness. Um, you know, homeless activism, um, trying to address those issues and find ways to help out. And... Um, there are people doing some good work out there, but I don't think, I, I, I think it needs to be more cultural specific, in my opinion, because you have one part of the community, say, the black community, they know their people, they know themselves better, they know the issues that they're going to be dealing with and facing, just like our native people. We should have that chance to have a say in how we set things up. You know, you can't just generalize it you know, and expect everybody to jump on board and be a success story. It's just not happening like that. And I think they were overly ambitious, too, because they got all this funding that came in, you know, from all over the place to help out with it. And they're talking about getting all this housing. Well, you know, the economy's tanked. It's been tanking. You know, it's been that way for, what, a couple of years now? It's really just nothing. And so resources have kind of dried up, you know, um, and they do a uh, project, Homeless Connect, down at the convention center, and it's a kind of a one day, they do it like two or three times a year. Um, and it's basically, you go in and you get all these resources, so there's a lot of private and public places that are in there, you know, dentists donate their time, legal help, uh, haircuts, housing, uh, vet for veterans, and you know, just the whole big thing going on, a little meal going on. And they get all these volunteers in there. And that's kind of cool, you know. I mean, it, at least it's there. At least it's there. And it does get more people aware of what's going on. But it's only a temporary mandate, you know. It's it For that one person that gets help, there's three other ones that aren't going to make it to get that help. You know, they're just not going to because you can only deal with so many people. The funding's limited, you know? So, you know, some people get cut out. You might have one success story and three other ones that don't get the help that they need, you know, that they deserve, you know? Um, Yet everything that Mike does here, he this comes out of his own pocket and all of your guys' own efforts without any city help or any funding from anywhere. So you, and you were talking about how it's just so many red, much red tape that people would be starving if you weren't just doing it without the help of the government. Yeah, we can't afford to wait on government. We can't afford to wait on uh, organizations to have their meetings to address it. You know, we don't need 10 meetings to tell us what to do. You know, we just have to hit it and do something about it. You know, that's the only way we see is it getting done. 
you know, and we can develop things along the way if we had the funding, you know, and yeah, Mike takes a lot of money out of his own pocket, and there's other people that pitch in, you know, come and drop off some money or food items, that type of thing, and we do a coat drive uh, at the Thanksgiving Powell here at the center, you know, they've always put me at the head of that, so I've been doing that for a few years now, you know, getting coats out to the community, and especially our kids, and um, this is this is all just... This is what we do. You know, we, we're not going to wait around for the bureaucracy, red tape to get cleared. And we just, we can't, you, you know, it takes too long. It just takes too long. And, you know, and then they start coming up with, you know, rules and this and that. It's like, no, 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 no. We're trying to feed them. We want to let them know that we care, that they can be fed, you know, that, you know, some, that, there are people out there who are looking out and thinking about. Yeah, we have we have people who uh, who have had babies out here. You know, they went to the hospital, of course, but you know they walk around pregnant, no prenatal care, and of course when I see them, I try to make sure that they're not drinking, and you can't do that all the time. We have people who are huffing paint. They see me walking up, and they know I'm going to take their can of paint away from them. Um, I don't take the alcohol away because um, that's something that they have to do on their own. There's nobody in the world can say, you know, quit drinking and they're going to quit drinking. It has to be something that they have to do on their own. So, yeah, there's so many stories, so many sad stories, and a lot of them end, you know, when you, you hear, oh, did you hear they found so-and-so. And, -so. and when, you, when you know you hear the word found, it usually means that they're dead. And it's heartbreaking, you know, because like I said, I know these people, I know them personally, you know. There's some people down in Florida who got arrested for feeding the homeless. Have you heard about that? What do you think about that? That's stupid. Why would you arrest somebody for feeding somebody who's hungry? That's a human right. You know, everybody needs to eat. What? That's to me. That's insane. To you know, it's probably you know along the lines of thinking that oh, you're encouraging them to come around to stay in this spot by feeding them. Well, where else are they supposed to go? You know? They said they're permit only allowed 25 people and they fed 40, so they got arrested. That's... You, How do you turn away the other people? It's, that's just stupid. It, you know, what... To arrest somebody for helping somebody, it's just stupid. The way these laws are set up and the mindset of certain people out there... It's killing us. It, it divides us. Nobody wants to help each other anymore. You know, I mean, it's, it, they make it so hard. You got to jump through hoops just to feed somebody, to put clothes on their back, you know, and it, they just make it more difficult when they do things like that. You know, it's, it just defies logic in my opinion. You know, it, you know, what, who are these people? You know, why do they do this? You know, it's, uh, and it's like, you know, with the group here, the Heading Home Hennepin, they were um, starting this thing, um, create change or something, give change or something it was called, but to stop the panhandling and the signing that goes on, you know, around here with the people panhandling for money and holding their signs. And they said, well, instead of giving that dollar or that $5 to that person on the street corner, give it to this organization and they'll take the money and put it out there. Well, how long is that going to be and how much is that going to cost that organization to get it? How much of that money is actually going to reach them? You shouldn't be trying to tell people and regulate what they do. If they feel like they want to throw somebody on the street corner 20 bucks, that's their business, you know? And if that person takes that 20 bucks and goes and buys a jug of booze or whatever, or some pills or some crack, that's what they do. Okay, look at why they're doing that. You know, what's the reason they're doing that? Um, don't try to regulate people for trying to give and help. And, you know, that's, no, that's just... Not all of them are doing that, but people just associate it with that. You know, there's a lot of people who aren't drinking and doing drugs that are homeless who are trying to get a better life. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's one of the things I really cooled out on the drinking part, you know, and being homeless. It was just too much to deal with. And... I was really looking to try to at least get to a place where I have a roof over my head and I have a job again, and, you know, and just taking care of business. Um, and it, it's a struggle, you know. I 
it doesn't happen overnight and you really got to want to have to do it you know and I had given up before so I know what it's like but those other people have just kind of given up you know and they just forget it I don't want to try anymore I don't want to do this because it's so hard they run into walls and you know um, you know it's just you know they you can leave us with one message to, uh, on <laughs> what would that be in regards to everything you're doing and with our own brothers and sisters out there on the streets on how people can help um, well, think about it, you know, even though you, you may have experienced that situation yourself or a family member, you know, um, and the bad memories that may have come about or, you know, heartbreak and, you know, too hard to deal with somebody who's drunk all the time or pilled up or whatever, do a little something, you know, try to do something. You don't have to be out front on, you know, speaking out about the issue, but try to find a way. You know, you got an extra winter jacket, go find somebody on the street when the cold weather starts coming and give them a jacket, you know. Um, find, you know, fill up some jugs of water in the hot summer days, you know, go out there and see where they're at, you know, and give them some of that water, you know, even buy some tobacco if you can, you know. It's like sometimes a cigarette's all you got to calm your nerves, you know, and, you know, give them some tobacco, give them some cigarettes, whatever, you know. Don't be afraid to help. Don't be afraid to interact with people on the streets. Because that could be you. You know, that could be your family member. Um, just participate, you know. And, you know, just don't be somebody... Like me, myself, I'm not trying to be somebody who is pre preaching these traditional native values and this and that. And then kind of like just talking about it and then walking away. Nine to five, done. No, just live it. Live it, you know. Um... Because you don't know what this person's been through, what they're going through, you know. It was like me, I was a heartbroken dad, you know. I didn't see my daughter for a lot of years and still waiting to reunite with her. But, you know, that was one of my things, you know. It's just, you got to look at the situation. Don't assume everybody's a bum, that they're dirty, that they're all doing drugs, you know. There's mental illness that goes along with it. And just sometimes hard times, like the bad economy has put them there, you know. Just find a way that you can help. Even a simple hello acknowledgement that they're there is can make a difference, you know? Uh, yeah, just be kinder to each other, you know? Look out for each other, you know? I, that's what I remember people doing a long time ago and hearing them stories when our Indian people first came to the city is that they were helping each other out. But it's less and less now, and now it's got to be like a non-profit structure. It's got to have a board, and, you know, you got to have... 10 meetings and you know before anything gets done you no know, it's, it's it doesn't have to be that hard you know just get up and do something you know help out your brothers and sisters out there well thank you for taking some time with me and sharing your stories and some people's other people's stories out here it means a lot i use that tobacco when i smoke it i pray for my sons my poor sons that i can't be with Thank you guys for this time. But I, what I bring to you, I bring to you from my heart, from my good spirit. There's nothing else I have in me. I'm a, I'm a holy man in Minnesota because I carry the sacred pipe for the Dakota Sioux. But my goodness comes from the spirits. And I always use my tobacco though. Even though I smoke it, I, I will take, I usually carry a bag of tobacco just so I can put it by the trees and pray for everybody. I pray for all the people, even the ones that don't have nobody to pray for them. And that's the way I was taught. Without each other, we have nothing, you know. And like here, this gathering at Mike's, that's good because Mike brings all these people together. No matter how much alcohol they've had or anything, they still seem, seem to exist together as brothers and sisters, no matter what their problem might be. Just like my sister and her boyfriend. Yeah, I saw him dancing yesterday at the gathering there. I felt so proud of him because he drinks all the time and he's full of alcohol, but his spirit is good. It's that suit blood he has is still good. That made him get out there and still dance. No matter, and he's crippled, so, but he dances. He did his dance because he's a warrior. And I told him, I said, nephew, you made me really proud yesterday when you danced. That was a good choice for my sister to be with me. 
he says that to them right away. He says, well, I came here and I stayed because he uh, snagged a woman. And he was talking about Jane. It's really wonderful, and if we can get some more help out there, it'd be great. So thank you. All right, we wish. Okay. Thanks for talking. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kimberly Acosta with Indian Country TV. All right, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. Where is the response from the the leadership out there? Um, why aren't we getting more active in? trying to find ways to solve this problem. I thank you for this time. Me and which? I thank, and I thank you for listening to me, and I thank you for this sister that does this work for us. Me which, Russell, I appreciate your time. Uh -huh.